I think we are probably ready to start. It looks like people have stopped filtering in a bit. And this afternoon, uh, this talk is going to be on auto wiring containers. My name is Bo Simonson. I'm the technical product manager for Sensio Labs. If you want to find me on Twitter to uh, heckle me virtually, uh, you can find me at, at Bo Simonson. Um, and you might also know some of the other things that I've worked on that are semi Drupal related, or at least Drupal community aware. Um, I, I created Get Sculpin, our, the Sculpin static site generator, which at least for a little while a lot of Drupal people were using because it was a good way to uh, learn about Twig. And Stack PHP was another project that I created. Um, and that's actually part of Drupal core now. Uh, it's uh, one of the things that's used to help bring Symfony components into Drupal 8. This talk is going to start out with a little bit of terminology, uh, just so we can all understand what we're talking about here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my personal history with containers and auto wiring. And then we're going to look at some of the current implementations of containers and where auto wiring exists and where it doesn't. And then we're going to look at the future. Specifically, we're going to look at the future of uh, Symfony's uh, dependency injection component when it comes to auto wiring containers. So this is the first talk I've ever given uh, where I've bothered to break out solid. How many people have seen talks talking about solid this, this conference so far? Uh, just, oh, okay, not a, not a lot of solid talks at DrupalCon. Okay, sounds good. Um, one of the reasons is that sometimes these acronyms are a little difficult for me. Um, I, I, every once in a while, forget that uh, the D in solid is not dependency injection. Uh, the D in solid is actually dependency inversion. So they're, they're, they're slightly different things. Uh, the de dependency inversion principle uh, talks about decoupling dependencies uh, between high level and low level layers. So it's not exactly dependency injection, but it does sort of have to do uh, with how things talk to each other. Dependency injection is more closely re related with an idea called inversion of control. And the traditional way the programs are written, and I imagine at least a, a good chunk of Drupal applications were written, um, is that you would just construct your objects as you need them and as you go. So you are taking full control over how your object graph is being created. The idea of inversion of control is taking that information uh, or taking that path and, and inverting it so that something else is creating the objects that your application is using. Probably one of the better known uh, implementations of inversion of control is dependency injection. So this is where dependency injection comes from. The idea that something has uh, inverted the control and is now creating the objects, the dependencies that your code needs. So that's what dependency injection is. It's actually an implementation of inversion of control. Another well-known implementation of inversion of control is service locator. And these service lo this is why service locator and dependency injection sort of get confused by people because they do similar things, but they have subtly different meanings. Uh, service locator, instead of being handed the dependencies that your object needs, it gives you a way to easily go get those objects without still having to know how they were created. So a lot of the dependency injection and inversion control containers are also service locators that let you get the objects that are in the container without having to actually say how those objects are created. So if we look at how these things are related, uh, you see a lot of uh, overloaded names and shared parts of the name. So we have dependency inversion, or, which is part of solid. Uh, so we have the dependency name there, which is also in dependency injection, which is actually an implementation of inversion of control that is sort of like dependency inversion, but not the same, even though they both have inversion in the name. And then there's this thing called service locator. To make things even more complicated, a lot of people will use uh, another term that they stick on these to talk about the thing that holds uh, all of the objects, and they usually call that a container. So you'll see something like a dependency injection container, you'll see an inversion of control container, you might see a service container, um, and sometimes you might just call them a container. And often, when I'm talking about containers, people always think that I'm going to be talking about Docker. Well, like, oh, you're talking about Docker containers, right? I'm like, no, you need to see this slide because it's completely different. So it's a completely overloaded name, but uh, it's something that it will be very helpful for you if you start realizing that container can mean other things. Another term when you talk about these sorts of uh, containers is this idea of wiring. And wiring is what you use to actually tell the container or tell whatever uh, piece of code is doing the inversion of control how these objects relate to each other. So that's generally giving it class names, that's telling it um, arguments for the constructor. Sometimes those are going to be, uh, uh, they might be primitives or they might actually be a reference to another object with, that's defined in the container elsewhere. So this is what one of these files might look like. You wouldn't have to look at it too closely now because we'll talk about it more later. But when we talk about wiring, that's the idea that we're talking about. <coughs> 
So a little bit of history, uh, at least my personal history on where these things came from. Uh, my first experience with a container was with Spring Framework's IOC container. How many people have used or heard of Spring Framework? Fair number of people? Well, okay, that's about half. Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, I, I first used it in 2007. I switched from PHP to doing JavaScript, or sorry, Java for about two years. Um, and I was initially confused uh, in the Java ecosystem because Spring talked about these things called beans. So these beans, I thought, were related to this idea of Java beans, which I hadn't really understood at the time. But they called them beans, and I didn't really get it. Um, it took me a long time to realize that a bean was just an object, and it had nothing to do with Java beans. This was just what the Spring framework had decided to call the objects that were in its container. I decided to use uh, the explicit wiring. So this was actually telling the, the objects how they, they interact with each other. And I chose XML over annotations because I thought annotations were evil. I didn't like them in my code anywhere. Um, and th these were actually proper annotations in Java as opposed to the comment-based annotations that we have in PHP. So I really liked the, uh, the XML because I felt like I understood what was going on. And what that looked like was an XML file with a container called beans, and then you would define each of the bean uh, objects uh, independently. So you would give it an ID, you would tell it which class uh, that bean represented, and then you would give it uh, some of the information that it needed in order to create it. So you might give it a uh, property, you might give it a constructor argument, uh, anything along those lines that the object needed in order to be created. You could then ask the Spring container for the message object, and it would make everything for you, and you would get back a message object that you could work on. So I was excited about this idea. I hadn't seen it anywhere else before in programming. Uh, so I talked to a friend of mine that was working at Google, and he told me about a project called Google's Juice. Uh, Google Juice was a, a lightweight dependency injection framework for Python. Python also has this sort of uh, annotation type thing, and it based its idea on this inject, um, uh, an inject, I can't remember what they call them, but it's basically like an annotation. So you would tell, in this case, the, the real billing service that you want to be able to inject things using Juice, and then you would get an injector for that object, and then you would ask the injector to get an instance of the thing that was configured. And this all seemed kind of interesting to me, but this sort of uh, suffered from a problem that I thought that Spring Framework suffered, which is what happens if you need multiple instances of an object uh, just configured differently? Because that seemed important to me, and it seemed like a really great problem that would make uh, auto-wiring pretty much useless, or this sort of auto-wiring system useless. And his answer was not very satisfactory for me. He basically said that doesn't happen very often. When it does, you can get around it. And that's all he said. And that seemed to be the, all I could ever find online when I looked up these problems was it's never very often a problem, and then there's always some really obscure way to fix it. And it turns out he was right. Um, you know, after I finally started using auto wiring a lot more, I realized that this, this big barrier uh, that I put in place was, a, was an issue that wasn't really going to happen very often. Uh, there were a few edge cases where I would end up having to do this uh, a number of times, but those were very few and far between. So it wasn't really um, as big of an issue as I thought it was. So after I got done working on Java for two years, um, I wanted to bring this back to PHP. Um, so I wanted to try and use some of the, the ideas that I used, or that I'd learned in the other language in PHP. The problem was that I sort of was my own little isolated island. Um, I didn't really have a lot of people that I talked to. I wasn't in the community in any way. So I ended up writing a lot of my old, own code um, and re reinventing the wheel. So I created a little uh, container I called Substrate. And this was going to be an inversion of control dependency injection container for PHP. And I didn't really learn the lesson that beans were confusing, and I decided to call my little object stones because that had something to do with substrate. It was really ridiculous. I look back and I laugh at it now. Um, I stuck again with explicit wiring because PHP at the time didn't really have uh, annotations. And if they did, it was very like one-off people trying to do some weird hacks with doc blocks. Um, so I just, it just made sense to stick with explicit wiring. Um, so the way that it worked was a lot like uh, Spring worked. Uh, you would have a context object, which was, was essentially a container. Uh, you would add something, you would give it a name, and then you would give it the, uh, the metadata to help uh, wire things up. So in this case, we look at a class name of a properties configuration, and then we can see that it has constructor args, and you can pass all the information in that you need to do. So this was really great. Um, I like this a lot. Um, it really fit my needs pretty well. Then I started adding this idea of auto-wiring. I'd seen this in the Spring Framework, but I didn't really understand it. I didn't understand why it needed to be there. And I implemented it a little differently, but it turned out to be pretty much the same. The idea was that as you were constructing 
a new object, you could go over all of the uh, parameters for the constructor. And if that parameter had actually been defined in the container already, it would just use the reference to that object, um, which means that you were able to automatically put in anything that was already defined as an instance within that container. Otherwise, it would use whatever had actually come off on the configuration. So what this meant was that if I had, say, a file logger, and I had a log factory that needed a file logger, uh, my configuration now would, would need to know about the logger. So I'd have to define the logger. Um, I would give it its constructor args, and then I would add the log factory, but I wouldn't have to specify the file logger anymore because it was able to actually find that within the system already. But uh, as is always the case, it's better not to always reinvent the wheel. Um, I started shopping around for a new framework. I ended up on Symfony. Um, it started to feel really familiar because it started out more or less, as I understand it, the port of some of the Spring Framework ideas. So it really felt really familiar since my, my own internal um, container was based on Spring as well. I was, I was particularly excited about the dependency, in, of, uh, dependency injection component uh, because it was a standalone thing that you could use uh, in Symfony or you could use it in your own applications. So it was pretty exciting for me. They had a bunch of other stuff that was great as well, but this was the one that I was uh, the most excited about. It was very flexible. Um, unlike some of the other PHP containers that were starting to grow around that time, uh, it seemed to be able to do a lot. It had a lot of different ways to load the configuration. You could do a PHP, you could do XML, you could do YAML. Um, all of these things that were just built in um, to it that just made it really, really pleasing to work with. It also had these things called compiler passes, which were extremely confusing for me to get at first, but they were very powerful. And the most interesting part about the compiler passes is that Symfony uh, the Symfony container can be compiled. This means that you don't have to interpret the, the binding, um, the, the wiring code every single time. You're able to create this big, huge file that has all of the services already defined so that you don't have to go through um, and execute that code every time to find the dependencies. So now that we've looked at uh, kind of the history of where we were, uh, we're going to take a look at a couple of implementations. Uh, the first one we're going to look at is a file called k.php. Uh, this is in almost all of my projects along with kk.php, k3.php, uh, basically any random text that just has a, has a bunch of procedurally generated or procedural uh, code to try and test out the project. Uh, so it's just basically a file that has inline uh, PHP in it. We're going to start with a, a really uh, specific class called important service. Um, and it's going to use one of the logger factories. And it's going to do an important task, which at this point is only going to log that it did that important task. So this is kind of where we're going to start. So we're going to add this class inline into k.php. And then we're going to create those objects by hand um, as they relate to each other. So we create the new file logger. We create the file logger factory that needs a file logger. And then we create the important, fact, uh, important service that needs the logger factory. And then we can ask that important service to do something. So this is the opposite of inversion of control. So if you're wondering what inversion of control is, really, this is the opposite of it. So anything else where other people or other p parts of the code are in instantiating your objects for you, you're doing inversion of control. If we wanted to do something like this in Symfony, uh, like the current version, uh, current stable versions of Symfony, uh, we could use a YAML file to do the same sort of thing. Uh, we can specify the, the services key. We're going to name it uh, file logger, give it the class, give it the arguments. Uh, we're going to do the same thing for the logger factor and the important service. As you can see, these little at signs mean it's referencing the services by name. So that's how it actually references existing objects within the container. And then you can just get the important service by name from the container, and then you can uh, do the important task. So this, this is how most of the containers are going to work. There's going to be some sort of wiring, some way to get an object out, and then you can use the object as you would normally. Uh, the, the XML loader version of Symfony's container uh, is a little more verbose, so you end up uh, typing a little bit more, but there's also a lot more validation that can happen. So it's, just, it's the same exact uh, end result, it's just different inputs. And this is one of the reasons that the Symfony container was really nice when I first started looking at it, because it let you do either. There's another container uh, used behind Silex. How many Silex users are there? Okay, a handful of Silex users. Uh, Silex is based around a container called Pimple. And the way that Pimple works is it uses an object that sort of acts like a, a typical array. And you define the keys uh, by name 
that then call a factory. So the factory's job is to return the object uh, for that. Uh, so we have like file logger here, and we're going to say return new file logger. Uh, logger factory is going to return new logger factory. It gets the container passed in, so you can ask the container for file logger. So this is the way that this kind of uh, container uh, configuration would work. There's another container uh, called Illuminate uh, container, which is actually Laravel's container. And I believe that it originally started out, uh, Laravel originally started out using something like Pimple or used Pimple itself, but eventually uh, it, it uh, gradually changed so that it started to use functions or method names rather than using uh, it as just an array. But it, otherwise it looks almost identical to the, uh, the, the Pimple implementation. It's just that it's using uh, method names instead of doing direct accessors. One of the things that the uh, one of the things that the Laravel community started to do that, that I thought was great was that they would start to instead of using the class uh, using the the uh, made up names here, they would actually use the class name of the object that was in question, which I thought was just brilliant. Um, this was this was so nice because one of the things that I really didn't like about the Symphony stuff was that I always had to come up with an ID. And generally it was basically copying the, the fully qualified class name and replacing the backslashes with periods, which you'll probably see that, <laughs> sorry, you'll probably see that quite a bit. Um, that or else you would end up with a completely shortened version of the name. And it, it, it was just kind of annoying for me to always have to go in and do that. I always felt like that was a, something that I didn't like to do. So I thought this was kind of a great thing. And the thing was, that I hadn't realized until I'd been using it for a little while that if I had done something like this with substrate, it would have been pretty awesome because what I could have done is look to see whether or not the, the stone instance existed for that class name. And if it didn't, I could actually ask the container to just make that parameter name. So it would actually go and make the class name. So I could specify class names now and even if that, that um, container, or even if that didn't exist, within the container config, it would know that the class name existed. It could still do the reflection on the class name and build everything up from there. So this would have actually been really nice had I realized that this was even a possibility. So what, what this looks like in the terms of like an auto wiring container, uh, like what Laravel has, if we look at important service, the container is being asked to make the logger factory. If the container knows that it needs a logger factory and it can create it by logger factory. Do we even need to specify that we need to do this? Like, do we even need to specify important service class at all? Because it's going to go over all of the arguments, find out that it needs a logger factory, and then it can go get the logger factory. And the answer is no. We don't actually have to specify that anymore. And the same thing here. If the logger factory needs a file logger, the container knows how to make a file logger. It doesn't actually need to define that either. So the container configuration keeps getting smaller because the container is smart enough to create the objects for the classes that are in question. Where it gets a little more difficult is if we start looking at something like this where we need, um, need to be able to find a way to inject um, a string primitive in this case, uh, we need to do something a little different. And the way that Laravel handles that is it has something called binding primitives where you can say when the file logger needs file name, give it this value. So now the container configuration only consists of this one setting to bind these values. These sorts of uh, auto wiring ideas are really great when you start looking at change. Like if we want to change important service now to do something a little more, like do something with the connection. Maybe it's actually going to do something now. It's going to execute something on a connection. Uh, what we do is we would add the connection as an additional constructor arg. We would type hint it, and then we would ask the connection to execute something within the do something uh, do important task method. If we go back to the uh, procedural implementation, this isn't too much worse. You have to add the connection part, um, and then you have to add the connection to the important service constructor. If we look at the services YAML file from Symfony, you have to add an additional uh, connection class now, and you have to update the important service to uh, reference that in the arguments. Uh, same thing for the XML version. You still have to add uh, these additional bits so that uh, you're now referring to the connection object with the connection ID. Uh, similarly, in Pimple, if you want to add another object, you just have to add an additional, um, additional uh, connection here, and then you would have to update the important services to do the connection. If you look at an auto wiring container, what you end up having is nothing. So because the important service knows, how to, knows that it needs a connection, 
and because the container can build the connection on its own, you don't have to change anything. So you can start adding dependencies and adding whole classes without ever having to modify the configuration for the container that you're using. This was something that I, I, I started to think about like middle of last year was that there were a lot of things when I was using the Symfony container that sort of drove or impacted my design because I no longer wanted to add a new class or do some refactoring because anytime I changed the classes or the hierarchy, I'd have to go in and change the configuration as well. And, and converting the k.php file that I would always have with all of this procedural code, I would dread when I actually decided to try and create the configuration for that because I would have to wire up the entire thing and it wasn't just, you know, working. So I, I found that this really started to impact my, my design and my development. And, I, and it was just a subtle thing in the background that I hadn't really realized until I started really using an auto-wiring container and realizing, um, realizing that this was having an impact on me. So the pros of an auto-wiring container are that it has an amazing developer experience. This is something that Ryan Weaver in the back is all about. I think that's his buzzword that, that he's excited about. It's an amazing developer experience because you're able to uh, do things quickly. You're able to not have to worry about configuration as much. Uh, so it's great for heavy refactoring sessions. If you want to take a dependency out of a, uh, one class and inject it later, uh, or inject it into the constructor instead of having it inline in your class, you can just do that, and chances are you're not going to have to actually change any of your configuration. For me, it leads to more code writing. I can actually focus on writing code and not have to worry about configuration. I just, I just don't have to worry about it anymore if I'm using an auto-wiring container. And it works like magic. It just works like it's supposed to, which is awesome. Um, you know, it, if you're into magic, it's really great, but I know some people aren't into magic. The cons for doing auto-wiring containers is that it's not really good for performance, especially if you're looking at Laravel's implementation where it's all, um, it's all function ba uh, uh, callable based. It has, um, uh, it does a lot of stuff with reflection. It does a lot of magic behind the scenes. So it's doing that every request. So this, this actually becomes, uh, at a certain point, at a certain scale, it starts to impact performance quite a bit. And if something like, uh, if a container like Symfony wanted to do this, it would start to become difficult to optimize this because all of a sudden you're looking for classes that, that aren't defined yet. You know, uh, at least with the, the, the current implementation of Symfony uh, stable, you're looking at um, a, a class that has to be in the service container in order for it to be able to be wired so that it could be dumped, so that it could be uh, high performance. That's just the way that it worked. So at least initially, this idea of auto-wiring for anything but something like a pimple or a Laravel type container was gonna be really difficult. And of course, a con is magic. So if you don't like magic, then you're really not gonna like auto-wiring. So in the future, I sort of see this best of both worlds sort of thing happening. What I'd really love to see is Symfony's container, like all the power of the compiled container, all of the uh, compiler passes, and all these really great things that Symfony's container has, but also have the developer experience that you get from auto-wiring containers. So I was really excited when Symfony 2.8 was released because I saw this really cool service auto-wiring thing that came out. And then I looked into the details and saw that what it really did was if you had a services container like a uh, services configuration like this where you're referencing service one, uh, you could auto wire service two and then uh, you wouldn't have to define service one anymore. But for me, like this really didn't seem very good. <laughs> I looked at it and I think I, I gave Ryan a hard time at Symphony Live one year because I'm like, I, this, this is great that we have auto wiring, but uh, it, you're still having to do all this stuff. It just didn't really make a lot of sense. So I was kind of unhappy about it, uh, but I wasn't a very good community member because mainly I just complained to Ryan about it, but I didn't do anything. Uh, fortunately, there are other people in the community who actually started to look at this and try to make things better. So one of the uh, first auto-wiring bundles that I looked at um, in recent time was a, uh, an auto-wiring bundle that, that had this idea of looking in certain directories and making certain types of classes where you could make them auto-wiring by default. So now at least we had one less level where we had to say auto wire true because to me if you have a if you have a class you have to define it anyway and say auto wiring true it just it's it's not going to be user friendly. The really exciting package that I ended up looking at was the action bundle. And the action bundle um, its job was that it was going to scan directories and what it did was it dynamically created objects that could then be um, in, uh, dumped into the container um, the dumped container 
that had services generated with the class name as the ID. So whatever class name that it, it found in the directories uh, was gonna be the ID. And then it was actually gonna enable auto wiring for them. So what this meant was that you could now create uh, a controller like this one, this home page that has a router interface and a twig environment that needed to be injected into it. Um, and it would just do this. The container would be able to create this object called home, or create both the class name of home page. So you could just ask it for it without any configuration. The container didn't have to do anything anymore. So this was really, really exciting to me. The other exciting thing was it turned out this wasn't limited to actions. Uh, as he worked on it uh, more, he realized that what he could do was um, scan any directory and create the same sort of services. So it was, it was something that wasn't just tied to controllers anymore, which was pretty awesome. So what we get with this is a very performance uh, friendly container. We get the optimization of being able to dump the container and we'd get the developer experience of not having to, at least for controllers or you know, very specialized um, types, of uh, types of objects, uh, not have to do any sort of configuration for them, which was really great. What's going to be really cool is that almost all of this now is baked into Symfony. So Symfony 3.3 has a bunch of really cool features that uh, cover almost all of these cases and make auto wiring and, and, and something else called auto configuring um, a part of the core Symfony experience. So I'm super excited about these. We're gonna talk about a couple of them. The first one is that optional classes can now be, uh, optional cl uh, the class name is now optional for the services defined in the Symfony container. And what that means now is that if there is no class name defined for a service, it's going to use the service ID as the class name. So we get to the point where we can actually have our class name as the key, so we no longer have to generate IDs or think of IDs or do any sort of things like that. We can just specify the class name as the, the service name, and then it just does the rest. Uh, couple this with auto wiring means that this becomes very, very tight now, which is very, very cool. However, we still end up with this auto wire true business, which is fixed in PR 21071, where we can actually now configure defaults for some of these values. So what that means is that rather than having to find class names with public and auto wire true across all of your classes, you can now define defaults with, auto, with public false and auto wire true, which means that any of the classes defined within this, this configuration file now are automatically going to be auto wired. So this is starting to make things very interesting. Now you might have had you know, 15 classes defined before where you had to basically duplicate this information if you wanted them auto wired, you no longer have to, which is really, really great. But we still have to actually define the classes, which is fixed in this PR um, called PSR4 based discovery and registration. So this, this is sort of some of the functionality that was in the action bundle where we actually can specify uh, a PSR4 uh, based name. Is that, how many people know about PSR4? Ah, uh, okay. It's a fair number of people. It's another auto loading standard. If you, uh, if you aren't aware of it, uh, where you can specify um, where things are. So this is PSR4 based. So um, here we see app controller. So you don't have to have app also in the, in the function or in the directory structure like you would with PSR0. So here, what we're saying is that anything within source controller or source command should be scanned. So it's gonna scan those directories now to find all of the classes uh, that are within those directories. And these, uh, any values that you put below then apply to any of the objects that are gonna be created as services automatically. So if you have a controller called home, you're gonna have a service called home and you're gonna have it auto-wired true by default. So this starts to get really cool because now we're not even having to define the actual, um, define the actual class names anymore. Basically any controller you create or any command you create for your console application is automatically going to be uh, scanned and picked up for you. On top of this, there's another interesting thing that was added to sort of uh, alleviate another issue that, that would come up with the configuration as far as having to do a lot of things over and over again. Um, and that's especially important with tags. So what this is saying is that every, every um, class within source, action, command, event subscriber, or twig is gonna automatically be scanned. 
any of those classes that are automatically scanned that are an instance of a command, we're automatically going to tag it with console command. So that was another thing that you would used to have to do with Symfony's container, is that you would tag things as a command, you could tag things as a uh, Twig extension or a kernel event subscriber. You no longer have to do that anymore because we can actually do these things in bulk. So we're gonna scan all of them and then add the tags as we need to depending on what kind of uh, object it is. Then the team took it a little bit further and decided that why do we even have to do that? Like why do we have to tell people that? We know that we have event subscriber interface and that everything that's an event subscriber interface implementation should have this tag. So why do we actually need to do that? And it turned out we didn't. We could leverage this instance of concept. So now there's a new key called auto configure true. So here we have app bundle event listener check requirement subscriber that is automatically going to be configured as a kernel event subscriber because that's all handled by core now. So this means that all we have to do is specify the class name. Now if we couple that with the PSR4 resource and registry, we wouldn't even need to have to do this. So the, the file gets very, very small um, and the configuration that's required to put these things into place suddenly become a lot easier. There's also an idea for named arguments in 3.3 and what that means is that if you have an object that is going to be auto-wired auto but you have additional things that can't be auto-wired, this is sort of like the binding primitive stuff that uh, we looked at earlier, the way that this is handled now is that you define auto-wired true for all of the services and then you just say that for this particular object the API key needs to be this value. Auto wiring picks up everything else. So this new syntax is all you would need to do to completely auto wire this service because it's able to get everything else. We're just telling it where it can get things that it, that it can't automatically determine on its own. And if you want to use the, the longer syntax that, that is currently available, um, you could do this as well. So you would say arguments, you would specify API key needs this value. And since we have auto wire true, it's gonna still um, automatically inject everything else for you correctly. This whole idea of auto wiring enabled another idea that we had. Um, and this is a, a way to inject objects into controllers. Um, and this is gonna be in Symphony 3.3 as well. Uh, so if we look at the original home controller that we had earlier, uh, it needed a router it needed a, uh, and it needed twig. What this can do now is we have a home class it doesn't extend anything at all and we have my action which we're routing to my action and we can ask for the request like we normally would but we can also say that we need a router and we need a twig for this action and what that is going to do is look and say we don't know where this comes from otherwise like if it's not already coming in from some other reason off the request it'll actually go to the container and say give me whatever implementation of router is currently registered for the router class so it'll go and look for these things now for you. So it means that uh, the, the, the old best practice for Symfony was that for controllers, you would generally look at the, um, the service locator itself. You would inject the container and ask for the services back out of it. Um, and that was just the, uh, because it was the best way to do it, the easiest way to do it at the time. And part of that problem was because if you had one file, one controller with say a dozen actions, they might all need slightly different dependencies so some of them might need the twig router, some of them might need a, uh, some doctrine repository to get information out of a database. Uh, some might need an API call. Um, so like you might need like an API client of some sort injected. So rather than trying to inject all of those in constructor injection, you would just inject the container and ask for things as you needed them. So they, they were kind of lazily loaded. Uh, with this, you're able to now say that this particular action needs these things. So if all of your functions need to access, say, a post repository, you could inject that in the constructor. But if you need something special just for a specific action, you no longer have to inject that into the, the constructor where you're not going to use it every time. You no longer have to inject the container and get, get that special object out when you need it. You just add it onto the dependency list on the function itself, and the auto wiring container can go in and get that information back out. And all of this is really going to be uh, coming together really nicely with Symphony Flex. Uh, if you want to learn more about Symphony 4, Symphony Flex, and some of the cool things that, that Fabian is putting together for the next uh, few releases of Symphony, um, you can check out his blog. It goes into a lot of this in more detail. But the coolest thing about Symphony Flex is that right now, as, as things stand, 
this is the default application configuration for the container. It specifies auto wiring true. It specifies auto configure true. So we're going to automatically auto wire everything and we're automatically going to be able to tag objects that implement certain interfaces. So we can automatically tag twig extensions, console commands, anything like that. We're going to do the PSR4 uh, re uh, registry for commands, form, event subscriber, twig, and voter. So all of these common things, as long as you create classes within those directories that are you know, appropriate to put in those directories, they're automatically going to be auto wired. So in theory, you won't have to do anything at all to add a Twig extension. You just add the Twig extension and it just works. Uh, you might have to you know, uh, re reload your cache um, if you don't have uh, the development mode on, but for the most part, you won't have to do anything at all. You won't have to define any additional services. For the app controllers, we have those set as public true because they need to be public, but we also um, are going to tag them all with the service arguments by default so that any controller you create can start leveraging this functionality where you can start requesting dependencies at an action level within a controller. So this is very exciting to me uh, because this means that out of, out of the box Symphony Flex applications are going to have full auto wiring, have all sorts of cool bells and whistles that just work and it's going to make a whole lot of development, a whole lot of developers lives a lot easier uh, because you're not, you're not going to have to worry about the, the configuration. So I really do see this as the best of both worlds. Uh, we have a really great auto wiring container now uh, within, within Symphony, and we have um, the, the, full f um, the full features, like we have uh, all the powerful features like compiler passes and being able to dump a uh, compiled container. We have that all now uh, within, uh, within the Symphony container. So a lot of people, like I've, I've actually talked to some people after the talk, um, if, if they've, this has convinced them to use auto wiring or not, and usually no. Uh, if you are already staunchly against auto wiring before, you probably are still so. Um, but the thing that I like the most about it and the thing that I want people to uh, consider is that what this, what this turns into is not just everything is auto wired. Um, it turns into only worrying about the exceptions. So if you're worried that, oh, if I start auto wiring, I'm going to run into a case and I'm going to be pigeonholed into this thing and I'm not going to be able to fix it, don't worry about it. If it doesn't work, wire it by hand. There's no reason you can't continue to manually wire some of your, some of your dependencies. It's not an all or nothing sort of thing. Auto, the auto wiring is there to handle the 90, 95, 96% case of everything working, but the manual wiring is still there if you want to try and do something that is outside of, the, um, outside of what auto wiring allows for. So I would just say give it a try, uh, especially uh, once the Symphony Flex stuff gets published It'll be really easy to uh, just give it a try, look at the app container, start creating controllers and just seeing that you can just create controllers. Create controllers and everything works. So, yeah. So I would say give it a try. How many people want to give this a try now? Awesome. <laughs> All right, that's better. That's better than, uh, than in the past. So that's pretty cool. So um, last thing I want to talk about is, uh, I'm sure you've seen this slide a bunch of times, there's supposed to be some uh, 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 sprints on Friday. Uh, Ryan Weaver and I, I think we're both going to be here for that. I know I am. So if you want to talk about uh, Symphony 3.3, you want to talk about the container stuff, if you want to talk about Flex, if you want to talk about Blackfire, uh, our performance tool that we have, uh, feel free to, to try to ping me or Ryan on Twitter um, and, and line that up. Otherwise, if you want to try and get uh, contributions into Drupal, this is a great chance to actually do that. So if you're kind of on the fence, uh, hopefully I've pushed you over the fence on that one. Um, if you can give me some feedback, either on Twitter, um, I, think, I think you can actually give uh, talk feedback on the, the Drupal website itself. Um, that works as well. Um, otherwise, I have, I have time to answer some questions, I think. Do I have time? I don't know what the schedule says. But if you have questions, um, just raise your hand and go to the thing. Yeah, if you can uh, go to the mic, that would be helpful. Yeah, no problem. Uh, do you know if this is planned for like D9? Drupal you know, or? that's something oh. that I don't know if, if Fabian knows or if anybody who's So the question, the, the, uh, Ryan's in the back, he answered it. I'll answer it for people who need the mic or the recording. Um, it sounds like uh, Drupal 8.3, was it? Yeah. Or 8.4. Uh, Drupal 8.4 um, is going to be uh, released 
Okay, so the plan is that Drupal 8.4 is going to go with uh, whatever the most recent version of uh, Symphony 3 will be. And at that point, it's either going to be uh, Symphony 3.3 or 3.4. So all of the stuff that we've talked about here uh, should be included um, in Drupal 8. All right, uh, Drupal 8.4. So thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, we, I, I actually attended uh, Ryan's tutorial with Drup Drupal and Symphony on, um, on Monday. I was one of the helpers. And there, was, there were a lot of things in there that were related to <sighs> my bad related to Drupal and to um, and the symphony that I I just know this stuff is going to make a huge help because uh, anything that you add if you want to add you know certain types of event listeners and things like that it'll just automatically work like if you get the the instant stuff stuff working yeah you won't have to define those things anymore you'll just generate them on the command line and then they will just work um, and so I think it sh should be pretty cool any other questions So I just want to be reassured on something here. <laughs> um, okay, so the auto, auto wiring is dependent on having the fully qualified class name as the service ID, right? So, yes. I mean, it just seems like if you're doing that, then you're kind of limiting yourself with the ability to substitute a compatible service. So if I have, you know, some user management service, mm -hmm. and then I want to swap it out for something different. I'm, you know, all my methods are compatible and whatnot. Then I, I can't. So, yeah. just tell yeah, me this so isn't a big deal in real life. Yeah. So this this is the, the this is the question that I asked that I never got a satisfied an satisfying answer on. Um, that you know whether it be swapping out implementations for an interface, or if you have uh, the same object that needs to be, um, or the same class needs you need six instances of it. For whatever reason, are differently configured. Um, I wrote a, I wrote a uh, a read model for an event sourcing system where I had a, a common uh, key value pair sort of thing, where I I wanted the the instances to always use the same PDO instance to do the actual SQL query, but I wanted the the table name to be different mm -hmm. for each instance. So um, so that's the type of thing that that I think it's very important that we're able to support uh, with Symphony 3.3. There is a there is a, an open PR uh, suggesting some um, some solutions for that, mm -hmm. but that one hasn't been merged yet, and that one is is kind of co uh, contentious right now mm -hmm. as to whether or not it will be. Um, but I, I, I did actually have some additional slides showing how this sort of thing works, mm -hmm. um, at least with like the, the the Laravel implementation. If we look at uh, here, we have Logger Factory wants a file logger. This goes against the dependency inversion principle because uh, it's a, an a logger factory shouldn't know about a file logger. Uh, what it should know is about a logger, and then the file logger should implement logger. So that this this is actually properly looking at like the dependency inversion principle. Uh, so the way that that Laravel would handle this is that you would specify that the logger class is bound to the file logger. So you so um, when the uh, logger factory is instantiated now, it's going to want a logger, um, and and the container is answering, oh, the logger is a file logger. So the way that we would do that in, in Symphony world um, is probably either using the bind parameters or using the, the bind PR that we're looking at, or you could actually set up an alias. So you can already do something like this where you can say, um, in the YAML configuration, you would just say that logger class colon, um, I think it's at file logger class. So we would already be able to do something like that that does part of it. Um, so this, this is how you would swap out an interface, but this is globally. So this would be swapping it out globally. Anytime you want a logger, you would get the file logger. So then the next pr problem, of course, is what if you want multiple instances with different configs? So the way that that, that works is with, uh, at least with the Laravel system, would be a contextual binding where you would say, you know, you have a null logger, you want an unimportant service that needs to, to not be logged. So the way that this would, um, the way that this would work is that you would say that when the unimportant service wants a logger factory, uh, it would do a function then to create a logger factory with the null logger. So that uh, when you make the unimportant service class, it's going to get the, serv the, the logger factory that has the null logger in it. Uh, but if you do the important class, uh, you would get the other one. So this still is all about exceptions. So this is the exception that logger class can't be instantiated. So the, the configuration for this is gonna be file logger. So I mean that, that's an exception. If you want, uh, so any class now that needs a logger is going to get file logger, except 
where we've, we've uh, put up a rule to, to do an exception here. So this is the one that I'm not exactly sure what, how the Symphony container is going to support this yet. This is one of the, you know, like I said, it's, it's a contentious PR because uh, we don't really know the best way to implement this because people need to use it first before we can see when these cases happen. Um, I know that I ran into to valid use cases for this with the, the read model example, um, but there, there's probably other ways we could do this as well. Um, I, I know that I've worked around this sort of thing in the past by creating wrapper classes that are basically just decorators with a specific class name then that I can use to type in that class name in certain cases. And then I would get everything that I wanted, but let's kind of work around your container instead of actually trying to get the container to do the work for you. So this, this is how you would solve these sorts of things. I, I don't have any doubts that we will finish some sort of solution or we'll have some sort of solution for this for Symphony 3.3. Um, and if it's not in 3.3, I'm sure we'll have something by 3.4 that will, will solve these issues. So I hope that answers the question. Um, I, unfortunately, I didn't have a, a Symphony example for that, but uh, it is a, a case that I know that I had personally. Um, but again, that, like, I, had to, I had to use this for a very long time before I ran into that edge case. Mm -hmm probably like a year and a half of doing auto loading where I didn't, or auto wiring where I just didn't care until I ran into this particular use case. So it is something that, at least in my experience, happens very rarely, and there is a, a way around it. It looks kind of ugly, but at least in this case, there's an example, uh, a workaround. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Any other questions? Cool, all right, I guess I'll let you all, all go. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 